God, we're so thankful for the day that you provided for us today. We're thankful for the coolness of this location where we can be worshiping you. But we're especially thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for our sins so that one day we can be with you. So, Father, we ask that you be with us each day, each step of the way, to help us know that you are involved in our lives and are directing our path. But as we go through each day, help us to be intentional about it with our eyes open, to see the movement of your Holy Spirit directing our lives in the path that you want us to take. As through Christ we pray. Amen. Okay. Can you go back to the prior slide? Please. Okay, so Dale knows this, and probably, I don't know, Doyle knows this too. This is the seventh hole at Pebble Beach. It is probably the most photographed hole in all of golf. You see this all the time. Or 109 yards long, and then depending upon the wind condition, it can be very different. So as most of you know, I was absent from you last Sunday. It's because my wife had uh, surprised me for my 65th birthday to be playing at Pebble Beach, which I did last Saturday. You know what? I, the, the, the weather is something. So this hole is, as Dale said, about 89 yards long could be as long as 109, depending upon where you're hitting from the tee box. And as you can kind of get an impression, you're hitting from what's called an elevated tee. It's like 40 or 50 feet higher than the green surface. And then, of course, you have the Pacific Ocean, and then you have the winds. So it's what I call target golf. And there were, I played with, uh, my wife rode along with me, but I was playing with another dad and his two sons, and they had a couple caddies with them. And the caddy's advice to all of us was bring an extra ball. That's not a good way to start out your thinking about your next golf shot. <clears throat> because as you can see, there's not a lot of room for air. You're either in the trap or in the ocean or on the green. So my golf is, I hit it and I hope. So I did that. I said a quick little prayer like Nehemiah, and what do you know, I actually put my ball on the green. And I was within inches of getting a birdie. I mean, I actually parred this hole, and I parred several others. But there were a few other holes that I didn't par. Those are called bogeys or double bogeys. And because I just wanted to enjoy the experience, I didn't even bother keeping score. So I can't tell you what I shot for my round, but I can tell you with some pride that I actually parred the most photographed hole on the planet. So that's where I was. Thoroughly enjoyed my time. Okay, next slide. So let's talk about the reason why we're here. The message today is called Extraordinarily Ordinary. And it's taken from the book of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed, he's just a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters. I mean, they all live right here among us. They were deeply offended, and they refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his own relatives and even his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Now, I'm just assuming, but if you're anything like me, on most days, you woke up this morning to just another ordinary day. A butler didn't draw your bath, and a maid didn't lay out your clothes. 
your eggs weren't Benedict this morning, and your orange juice wasn't fresh squeezed. But that's okay, because there's nothing particularly special about today. I mean, it's not like your birthday or Christmas or anything, right? It's like most every other day, just an ordinary day. So you went to the car, and you climbed into your ordinary car. Now, you've heard about executives and sheikhs who get helicoptered to their office, right? You've heard about those folks. Uh, But you? Well, maybe a stretch limo may have taken you to your wedding reception, but since then it's been mostly minivans and sedans. Ordinary cars that take you to your very ordinary job. Now, you take your job seriously, mind you, but you wouldn't call your job extraordinary. You're not exactly clearing your calendar for the president or setting aside time to make yourself available to testify in front of Congress. You're just making sure that you get your work done before the evening rush turns the interstate into a parking lot. Because if you're delayed, you need to be ready to wait in line at that signal, or in line at the grocery store, or in line at the gas station. Now, if you were the governor, or you had an Oscar, you probably wouldn't have to wait because you could avoid the crowds. But I don't see Governor Newsom here this morning, number one, and I don't think any of you have an Oscar on your mantle. So you have to go through these steps because you're ordinary. You lead an ordinary life, that's punctuated by occasional weddings, job transfers, maybe a bowling or a golfing trophy, and graduations. Generally speaking, your ordinary day-to-day rhythm is pretty much like the rest of humanity. As a result, I'm thinking that you could probably use a few tips that you might need to know how to succeed at being ordinary. Because ordinariness has its perils. A face in the crowd can feel very lost in the crowd, especially when you're feeling ordinary. And you might think that you're unproductive. I mean, maybe you wonder if you'll leave any kind of lasting contribution when you're gone. Maybe you feel insignificant, too, and you start asking yourself questions like, do the ordinary really rate in heaven? Does God love ordinary people like me? Well, God answers those questions in what I think is a most extraordinary way. Because if the word ordinary describes you, then I want you to take heart because it also described Jesus. Christ? Ordinary? Come on, I mean, since when is walking on the water, speaking to the dead, or being raised from the dead, ordinary? Can we really call the life of Jesus ordinary? Well, for about 90% of it we can. For instance, when you list the places where Jesus lived, I want you to draw a circle around the town called Nazareth. Nazareth is a blip on the edge of boredom. Home to maybe 400 people, it's about the size of present-day Bowlegs, Oklahoma. For 30 of his 33 years, Jesus lived a pretty ordinary life. Aside from the one incident that we know about in the temple when he was 12 years of age, we have no record whatsoever of what he said or what he did for the first 30 years that Jesus walked on this earth. And were it not for a statement in Mark's gospel, we wouldn't know anything 
about Jesus' early adult life at all. It's not much, really. Just enough of a thread to kind of weave a thought or two for those who suffer from the ordinary life. Now, if you hang out with NFL superstars and you subscribe to Yachting Monthly, you can tune me out. But unless you know what you would say to, let's say, Peyton Manning, or you've never heard of a magazine called Yachting Monthly, then this is for you, because here's the verse. He's just a carpenter. See, I told you, it's not much. It's taken from Mark chapter 6, verse 3. And it was Jesus' neighbors who spoke those words. Not his disciples, not even his family. He's just a carpenter. Apparently, amazed at Jesus' latter life popularity, the townspeople were basically saying, isn't this the guy who fixed my roof? That's what they're saying. Note, too, that the neighbors didn't say, isn't this the carpenter who owes me money? Or, isn't this the carpenter who swindled my dad? Or maybe, isn't this the carpenter who never finished my table? No, you don't see those words because they were never said. The lazy have a hard time hiding out in a small town like Nazareth. Hucksters move from city to city to virtually survive. But Jesus didn't need to do any of those things. Did you need a plow repaired? Christ could do it. In need of a new yoke? Well, my neighbor Jesus, he's a carpenter. He'll give you a fair price, they'd say. The job may have been ordinary, but Jesus' diligence to the job at hand was not ordinary. Jesus took his work seriously. And although the town where he lived may have been ordinary, his attention to the town where he lived was not. The city of Nazareth rests in a bowl that is created by a nearby mountain range. And a young Nazarene boy like Jesus at the time could maybe not resist taking a hike to the crest to look over the valley below. And sitting at 1,600 feet above sea level, the young Jesus could have observed the world that he'd made. Mountain flowers maybe in the spring, simmering sunsets from that vantage point, pelicans winging their way along the streams of Kishon to the Sea of Galilee, which is about 11 miles as the crow or the pelican flies. Fields and fig trees off in the distance. Do you suppose that moments like those were inspiration for words that Jesus would say later on? For instance, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 28, observe how the lilies of the field grow. Or, Look at the birds of the air, which he said in Matthew 6, 26. The words of Jesus the rabbi were born in the thoughts of Jesus the boy. And to the north of Nazareth lay this wood-crowned hill of Naphtali. And conspicuous on one of those hills is a village called Safed, S-A-F-E-D. And it's known in the region as the, quote, city set upon the hill. So was Jesus maybe thinking of that city when he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden? The maker of yokes would later explain in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The one who brushed his share of sawdust from his eyes would later say in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own? 
He saw how a seed on the path took no root in Luke chapter 8, verse 5, and how a mustard seed would produce a great tree, which he noticed in Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. He remembered the red sky in the morning, which is made reference to in Matthew chapter 16, verse 2, and the lightning in the eastern sky, Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. You see, church, Jesus listened to his ordinary life. And the question is, have you? Maybe rain pattering against the window. Maybe the the giggling of a baby in a crowded mall. Seeing a sunrise as maybe the rest of the world sleeps. Aren't these personal epistles to you? Can't God speak through a Monday commute or maybe even a midnight diaper change? Take notes on your life. There's no event so ordinary that God isn't present within it, always leaving you room to recognize him or not. But the next time your life feels ordinary, Take your cue from Jesus Christ. Pay attention to your work and to your world. Jesus' obedience began in a small town carpenter shop, but his unordinary approach to his ordinary life then groomed him for his extraordinary call. Because it says in Luke chapter 3, verse 23, when Jesus entered public life, he was about 30 years old. And in order to enter into public life, you have to leave your private life. And in order for Jesus to change the world, he had to say goodbye to his world. He had to give Mary a kiss goodbye, maybe a final meal in the kitchen, maybe walk through the streets. I mean, did he ascend one of the hills in Nazareth and think of the day he would ascend the hill near Jerusalem? I mean, he knew what was going to happen. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, God chose him, referring to Jesus, for this purpose long before the world began. Every ounce of suffering for Jesus Christ had been scripted. It just fell to Jesus to accept his part. Not that he had to. I mean, look, Nazareth was a cozy little town of maybe 400 people. So, you know, why not capitalize on his dad's business and build this carpentry business in Nazareth and keep his identity secret. Or maybe Jesus should have come in the era of guillotines or lethal injections and take a pass on the cross. I mean, to be forced to die is one thing, but to willingly take up your own cross so you can be murdered on it, is something entirely different altogether. In fact, it reminds me of a story about the McElroy family. The fact that the McElroys adopted two children is commendable, but it's not uncommon. The fact that they adopted special needs children is significant, but again, it's not completely unique. It's the severity of the health problems of the children that they adopted that set the McElroys apart. Selena was a cocaine baby. Her birth mother's overdose left Selena unable to hear, unable to see, unable to speak, and even more. Penny and Alan McElroy adopted her at seven weeks of age. The doctor gave her a year to live. So ruffling her hair and squeezing her cheeks wouldn't ever get a response from Selena. 
because Selena will never be able to respond. And then neither will her sister, Destiny. Because in an adjacent bed, one-year-old Destiny lays equally motionless and vegetative. Penny will never hear Destiny's voice. Alan will never know Selena's kiss. They'll never hear their daughters sing in a choir or watch them play maybe in a soccer game. They'll bathe them. They'll change them. They'll adjust their feeding tubes and rub their limp limbs. But this mom and this dad, they'll never hear more than just gurgled breathing. What kind of love is that? What kind of love adopts a disaster? What kind of love looks into the face of these two children knowing full well the weight of their calamity and says, oh, I'll take them. When you can come up a word for that kind of love, then give it to Jesus. Because the day Jesus left Nazareth is the day he declared his devotion for you and for me. We were just as helpless as Selena and Destiny in a spiritually vegetative state as a result of sin. According to Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, it says, we were living a dead, end, empty-headed life. But then Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, says, But God's immense in mercy and with incredible love embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. You see, church, Jesus left Nazareth in pursuit of the spiritual Selenas and destinies of this world and brought us to life. Ordinary? <laughs> Hardly. Or, well, Maybe, because here's Paul's advice to the saints in Rome, and I'm quoting from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, your walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. And he'll change you from the inside out. So, it turns out that an ordinary life, extraordinarily lived for God, is worship. Who knew? Can you live an ordinary life and do extraordinary things for God? Absolutely. We read about extraordinary things. We hear about extraordinary things. And many times, if you think about it, the extraordinary stuff we hear and see and read about is not for extraordinary good. It is somebody's train wreck. It is somebody's malfeasance. It's somebody's destroyed life. It's somebody's rumor and innuendo. Those are the people that are making headlines. And we just shake our heads and just say, man, how could that be? So maybe being ordinary isn't all that bad. Because an ordinary life lived extraordinarily for God is worship. Did you know that each step you take, each day of your life can be an act of worship. Look, you can be a living sacrifice, which is now a new creation, 
because he is changing us from the inside out. So church, if you ever wake up and think, man, what difference do I make in this world? It's just so ordinary. I'm not that important. Nobody really knows about me. I have kind of an okay job and I drive kind of an okay car. My family's okay, but we have problems. How can I make a difference for God? You know what? You can make a huge difference for God. Because if you give your life in an extraordinary way for the God that you came here to worship today, he will bless you and your life and those with whom you come into contact. That's what worship's all about. You came here today not to levitate out of this building with some halo on your head, right? You came, hopefully, to find some inspiration, number one, but you came here to worship. You woke up in an ordinary Sunday morning, got in your ordinary Sunday car, put on your ordinary, or maybe not so ordinary Sunday clothes, came to worship, and I hope you leave today extraordinarily changed because an ordinary life devoted in an extraordinary way is worship to God, and he can use that. And he'll change you, and he'll change those around you with whom you come into contact. So Arlene, can you go to the next slide, please? So we've sung this song a few times. And I've told you before, most of the people here have chosen to follow Jesus. So it's like, well, do we need to sing a song where I've already made that choice? Well, I don't know. Have you? Do you wake up every morning choosing to serve Jesus? Are each of your acts and each of your lives devoted to Jesus? That's making a choice. That's making a decision to follow Jesus. I mean, it's one thing to make a decision to follow Jesus and put him on in baptism and live your life as best you can. But are you conscientiously each day devoting what might be a very ordinary life to an extraordinary God to know that you will be changed as a result of making that choice and that decision? That's what this song is challenging you to think about. So we're going to sing this song. At the conclusion of this song, if you have any prayer requests, you can hand them up. We'll talk about them, and then we'll be dismissed. Let's stand and let's sing, please. God, we are so thankful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunities that you've given to us to live our lives ordinarily, but in an extraordinary way. Because as we do that in an intentional way, we're devoting our lives as a living sacrifice to you, which is our act of worship. Even making the decision to wake up in time this morning to maybe shower and get dressed and come to services today, that was an act of worship because we intentionally wanted to be here among your children and praise you. So God, accept these acts of worship as our heartfelt devotion to you and in thankfulness for the sacrifice of your son Jesus Christ in giving his life as a sacrifice for our sin so that one day we will be with you. But getting from here to there is difficult for some, if not for all, especially for two. She had two implants, so hopeful that she would have children, and now she's been informed that both of the fetuses have died. And she's made the decision from a medical standpoint to deal with it in a way that is mind-boggling in terms of it's just this heart-rending sadness. And so, God, we pray that you'd be with two. Pray that you'd be with her family. And pray that you'd be with her and help her to regain her physical self and perhaps provide her with another opportunity to have children which she so very much wants to have. Father, we're also mindful of Billy, who's going in for a a procedure on Wednesday. We pray, Father, that the pacemaker and its placement will be successful, that it'll be minimally invasive, that as anticipated, she'll be treated as an outpatient and have the procedure and be able to go home later that day. But please be with her, be with the doctors who tend to her and the nurses and the anesthesiologists and all the other staff whose roles in these things are so important. And also bless Glenn, who is coming alongside his wife as he does every day 
give him the strength and the ability to, to tend to Billy as she recovers from this procedure. God, we're going to miss Alvin and Chandra. They are such a blessing to this church. But they've got family that they just love and adore. And they live in Detroit, which is a long way away. And because they've got things that they want to bring with them that aren't easily transportable by aircraft, they're going to be driving. So it's a long drive. And so many things can happen. So God, we pray that you would watch over Alvin and Chandra. We pray that you would bless their lives as they travel out to Detroit. We pray that you would bless them as they bless others by being there with their family. Give them a great time together with their kids and their extended family as they're there. Allow them to enjoy that portion of the country, Father, where they grew up and they're so comfortable in and they know the local hangouts and things and fun things to do. I pray, Father, that you would just bless them in those activities, not just them, but their extended family with whom they come into contact. And then, of course, bring them back here safely. Father, it's good to have Richard King back with us, and he wants us to pray for his friends, Dakota and another Dakota, and Liam. Father, we do pray for Dakota and Dakota and Liam, and we ask that you would interject yourself through your Holy Spirit in their lives. Transform them to be the kind of children you want them to be. Help Richard be able to minister to them as he can to encourage them and to watch over them and guide them as best he can in his ministry as he relates to those individuals. And, of course, Liam is moving to Miami. So we pray, Father, that you would be with him and the choices that he's made and the new location where he's being situated. Given what Richard explained to us, it sounds a little scary, but obviously Liam's not the only one that lives there. So we ask that you'd watch over him and guide him. Father, you've blessed this church with so many different things, a great facility within which to live, beautiful people with whom to worship, an environment and a location, Father, where we can be, I don't know, a city set on a hill. So, Father, help us to reach out to the community within which we live and worship. Guide us and help our efforts to grow this church spiritually, physically, numerically, in every possible way, Father, to be an influence for good in this particular community. So be with each of those who are here. Watch over them this week. Guide their steps. Allow them to understand that their ordinary lives, extraordinarily devoted to you, is worship. And that is what you are asking from each of us. So God, guide us, watch over us, and protect us, and bring us back here next Sunday. As through Christ we pray. Amen. 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 God bless all of you. Have a great day and a great week.